Hello, everyone, and welcome to our eighth edition of LASER. This is our first LASER talk of the year. It's virtually, as you probably all are very used to. Um, it is for this time um, planned in a collaboration with the associates in the different Swissnex departments. That is James Moore from the Academic Relations um, in Boston, Mel de so uh, Jaco de Sombe from Media and Innovation in New York, and myself, my name is Laura Antonietti, and I'm the Arts Plus Associate here in Boston in our consulate. Today, we will dive in the world of data and its future, and we will have the pleasure of exploring the work of three outstanding experts based in Switzerland, and for this time in Los Angeles. We invited from Switzerland, um, Professor Dr. Robert Grass, who is a professor at ETH in Zurich, Dr. Christine Schwara, the Chief Innovation Officer of the Swiss Data Science Center, and from Los Angeles, the media artist and director, Refik Anadol. Before we dig in deeper though, I want to briefly introduce Swissnext to those of you who are new to our community. Swissnext Boston is a Swiss science and technology um, consulate that focuses on creating networks between Switzerland and the United States. And we do that in the areas of research, innovation, and also the arts. In the arts in particular, we do that by supporting artists. We support designers, cultural institutions, and art schools in expanding their reach in North America, um, finding right partners here, and finding also platforms to show their work. We have partnered with SciArt Initiative to bring LASER to Boston, because uh, these events embody the interdisciplinary dialogue and connection that we at Swissnex find very important. Now, I will give the word to Julia, who will tell you more about SciArt and LASER, and has the pleasure of introducing our wonderful speakers for this event. Thank you so much, Laura, and thank you to everyone who's tuned in already. It's great to see you here. Um, so my name is Julia Buntain Howell. I'm the director of SIRE Initiative, and we are a 501c3 nonprofit based in the United States, um, although we have international programming. And we are really dedicated to bridging the gulf between the arts and sciences. We do this in a number of ways. If you're new to SciArt, we have a publication, a residency program, we have exhibitions, and we have multiple monthly event series, which are all now virtual. So if you'd like to learn more about us, you can visit SciArtInitiative.org. Um, a bit about Laser Boston. Again, Laser Boston is co-organized by SciArt Initiative and Swissnex Boston, our amazing partners. Laser is actually a program of Leonardo, uh, the International Society for the Arts, Sciences, and Technology. So LASER is um, a program in Boston for us that meets about four times a year, and we feature local and visiting artists, scientists, technologists, and creative professionals. And now that we're doing this virtually, we've been able to expand our local focus to a much more global focus, which has been a huge silver lining in terms of speakers and audience. It is my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Robert Grass. Robert Grass is titular professor at the Functional Materials Laboratory at ETH Zurich. He studied chemical engineering at ETH with a stay at Case Western Reserve University Cleveland in 2003, after which he pursued a PhD at ETH Zurich. Robert Grass is involved in several areas of teaching chemistry, involved, involving courses for small children, high school chemistry education, process control education of chemical engineers at ETH Zurich, and is a member of the advisory board of the ETH Student Project Press. His research encompasses nanomaterial science, surface chemistry, and nucleic acid research, and has resulted in over 110 research papers, 11 patents, and four book chapters. Robert, I would ask you to turn your camera on and uh, take it away. Yes, hello. Hello, everybody. Thanks for the fake kind introduction. I'll share my screen. Um, I hope you see my slides. No, you don't. Um, now you should uh, see my slides. Perfect. Perfect. Yes, so thanks for everybody for your interest. I want to talk to you about how we can use DNA 
to store digital information for the future. Before I really start, let me ask, start with the question is, how important is your private digital information really to you? You can use this poll if somebody, if you lost all of your digital private information, what would you pay somebody as a finder's fee? Less than 50 cent, between $1 and $50, 50 to $500 or $500 and more. And at the end of the um, presentation, we'll shortly come back to that. Um, I'm sure you're all aware that the media we have to store our information have increased dramatically in the storage capacity, but at the same time, the amount, the, the, the time frame over which these uh, contain the information in a stable way has also decreased dramatically. Let's say on a memory stick or on a flash drive as we have in our phones and laptops, information is only stable for a very, very few years. And as we believe that information is getting more and more important to us, we have to find ways of storing these large amounts of digital information also for longer time horizons. And if you're looking for the right technology or device to do that, we might as well look back into history and think, what is the oldest information mankind has access to? And I think the oldest information we really have access to is this piece of a bone of a horse, which is 700 years, 700,000 years old. And from this bone, uh, scientists were able to recover the full genome of this horse. So they were able to read the DNA from this embedded in this bone, which is about a gigabyte of digital information. And this shows that DNA is indeed a storage format that can survive such extremely long time horizons and can give us information about um, our past. So we and other scientists have come up with the idea of using DNA as a hard drive where we use DNA synthesis to um, put information into DNA. We then think about what we do with the DNA once we have made it, and we also have to quickly discuss how we can recover that information again after uh, from, from the DNA. I'll very quickly give you an insight into, into these areas. Um, firstly, um, of course, digital information, any digital information, if it's a music file or a text, anything is on our computer represented as a long sequence of zeros and ones. And most probably you're also familiar that in DNA, our genome is stored in a very similar way. DNA is a fey in our genome is a fey long molecule or a few fey long molecules in which our genetic information is stored as a sequence of four nuclear bases, so four possibilities, A, C, T, and G, in, let's say, a format that's actually pretty similar to what we have in, in, in our digital format. Just that at every position, we have four possibilities instead of only two. And so we want to translate digital information into this uh, genetic code. Um, every two digital bits gets to one nuclear base, so we can easily say, and zero, zero is an A, and zero, one is a C, and one, one is a T, and so on. And so any piece of digital information we can translate, or anyone can translate on paper to DNA molecules. Now, as chemists, we also have the possibility of really synthesizing this DNA after that instruction. So once we have the instruction, we can make, actually synthesize those molecules in an automated way. So we can, like in Lego, we can kind of take building blocks of uh, these four possibilities, these four bases, A, C, T, and G, and put one on top of the other. We can not only do that with one DNA sequence at a time, but we can make millions of such DNA sequences simultaneously in automated synthesis processes. It's a little more complicated than uh, just Lego blocks. It's a circular process with uh, several steps, but the take home is an automated process with which we can make millions of different sequences, predefined sequences um, of DNA. Nowadays, we are also extremely good at reading DNA. Where just 20 years ago, it costed more than $100 million to read one 
human genome. So in the human genome project, so the first human genome to be sequenced was extremely expensive. And nowadays, you can more or less walk to your doctor and say you, have, you want to um, have information on a genetic disease, and your doctor can have your genome sequenced for the cost of about today between somewhere between one hundred or thousand dollars. That in information content, that's a few gigabytes of information that is read. So we're extremely good at reading human DNA, our genes. And if you're so good at reading our human DNA, we are also good at reading synthetic DNA because it's the same molecule. It has the same, let's say, ways of reading it, same machine, same technology. So if you're very good at reading genetic DNA, we are also very good at reading artificial DNA representing the digital information we want to put into it. And today, we also have access to nanopore sequences, such as the one pictured here that are very small and mobile devices with which genomes can be sequenced. They're not as powerful yet and as low cost as uh, to get, let's say, to this really large information for uh, low amounts of value. But the way forward is that it will be everyone will have the possibility of reading genetic information as long as he has a computer and this uh, small, small device. So we're really good today at reading genetic information. So I hope I've quickly convinced you that we can synthesize digital information in DNA by synthesizing DNA with a predefined sequence. And we're also very good at reading that information out. And I now want to shortly go into what do we actually do once we have the DNA synthesized? Where do we store it? What do we do in the middle here? Is DNA really as stable as I've showed you at the beginning? And there's a small problem in this. And that is that DNA actually isn't so stable. So if I take DNA molecules and put them in my lab somewhere in a flask, um, after a year or two, the DNA and the information will be lost. And that's some in contradiction to this host bone in which DNA is stable for such long times. And the reason for that, uh, what we believe is that in the bone, the DNA is engulfed in the calcium phosphate, the inorganic material of the bone, and it's protected thereby from air and water, which would react with the DNA and lead to decay. The bone really protected exactly as uh, this uh, um, uh, amber protects the mosquito in this ancient fossil. So bone is also a fossil protecting the DNA. And so if you want to artificially store information in DNA, and store it for the future, we have to have something similar as the bone in which we can put the DNA and it protect it from the environment. So as chemists, we came up with a chemical way of doing that, of protecting DNA. And the technology we came up with is to encapsulate DNA in small glass nanoparticles. So what you see on this image here is a glass nanoparticle and it has this very small gap here. And in that gap, we have captured DNA. And the DNA has glass on the inside and glass on the outside. So there's no water or oxygen which can access the DNA from the inside and outside. And in these particles, embedded in these particles, the DNA is really stable. We have shown that by storing some ancient documents, such as the Swiss Federal Charta or the Archimedes Palimpsest, one of the oldest um, scientific books. Um, that, have, that has been found. So we stored that information in DNA and have shown by rapid aging tests. So we can't wait for thousands of years. So we have to do accelerated aging. We do that in ovens at uh, um, increased temperature. We can simulate the damage we would get. And with that, we can show that information in DNA in these glass capsules can survive for about few thousand years at room temperature, if you would take it to the global seed vault in Spitzbergen, which is minus 18 degrees, it would probably be stable for towards a million years. And also in Switzerland, if you look for a really cold place, there's the Jungfrau Joch, which has an average temperature throughout the year of zero degrees. Information would be stable there for about 100,000 years. So indeed, we can take DNA, put information in it, and it's stable in there for a long time frames. So after we've uh, 
published the, this work sometime later, we were got contacted by the band Massive Attack. Um, they had this famous album, Mezzanine, 20 years ago, and they wanted to celebrate the 20 year anniversary of the album, and they asked us if we could store their music in DNA. And so we went and took the digital files, so not the vinyl as on this uh, picture, but the MP3 file, translated it to DNA sequences, more or less saying 0, 0 is A, 0, 1 is, and so on. And we get, uh, a, in this case, not one long sequence, but we cut that long sequence into many short parts for practical reasons. Uh, we then have that DNA synthesized by companies who uh, synthesize DNA, and we get these uh, small vials here um, containing a drop of water in that water. You don't see anything, but the DNA is in, is in there. Uh, we then took that DNA and encapsulated it into our small glass particles so that it's stable, resulting in a white powder. And then we talked to the, to the band and said, well, the result of your album is now this boring white powder, and we wanted to make it, let's say, more attractive for them in a way. It, it, we weren't happy with this white powder. And because one of the artists of Massive Attack is also a graffiti artist, we came up with the idea of putting these glass particles into a graffiti paint. One advantage of these glass particles is that you can mix them with almost anything, with liquids, with solids, with plastics. So you can put information into materials. In this case, as I said, we took these glass particles with the DNA and put them into a graffiti paint. And now the artist can take that graffiti spray can and sp spray a picture and literally in that picture, there's the DNA, and that DNA contains a digital file, the music of, of the album. And whereas this is still relatively playful, I think it shows that with DNA, we can store information in ways we can't with any other technology. There's no way with hard disks or with floppy or flash or anything similar, you can distribute information in a product as we can do that with um, DNA. We've also done a very similar project with Netflix where we stored a whole um, episode, 40 minutes of the biohackers in DNA and put it into this pink liquid. And what's fascinating there also is that every about 10 milliliters of this liquid, which in the end is still mostly water, contains a million copies of the whole episode. And that shows us this extremely high capacity, data capacity, DNA has per unit of mass. Um, that also brought us a little further into new ideas and new things you could do uh, with DNA, what we call the DNA of things. And so we have this, this bunny you see here. This is a 3D printed bunny, uh, which is special because inside the bunny, we have the DNA that encodes for the 3D file from which the bunny is made. Perhaps sounds a bit complicated, but I very quickly work you through it. So we can clip off a small part of the bunny, this piece of plastic. And from that piece of plastic, we can take out the particles and take the DNA out of the particles. We can then read the DNA by a DNA sequencer. And from that, we can translate this to a digital file. That digital file, is a three file that is readable by a 3D printer. So it's an instruction for a 3D printer. And we can then feed that file to a 3D printer and that 3D printer will then print another bunny because that's the information we put into the original bunny. So we can take a bunny in that bunny, so it's exactly like in us, in us, there's our genome in which there are the printing instructions, the, no, the genetic instructions, how we are to be made. This bunny contains the printing instructions, how we can make exact copies of this bunny. And again, uh, I want to highlight that this is something we can only do with DNA. There's no other storage format with which you can, let's say, put information into an object, read it, copy it, put it into a second object, and make many generations of equal objects, each containing um, digital information. So I have three conclusions. One, I hope that I could show you that DNA is an extremely compact and long-term stable data carrier. Um, DNA is unique as a data storage carrier because it can be distributed, it can put into materials and objects. And a really important 
aspect for me is you have to make backups of your data. The data we have, which is probably important to us, I'm not quite sure um, the result of the poll, um, which I don't see. Uh, can somebody help me? Ah, now is it, uh, ah, I don't know if everybody can see that. The result of the poll is that more than 50% of the participants would pay more than $500 to have their data back. And the other half of the people will pay somewhere between 50 and $500. So your private data is extremely valuable to you. And so it's very important that you, everybody, that's the same for me, and that's something I really learned when doing this research on DNA, on data stability. It's really important that you take care of your private information and back it up by making several backups at different places on different formats and please, please do look after your data because of course I, I'm doing this research on future technologies of how we can preserve data. But today we still have flash drives and hard disks and they are not extremely well suited to keeping information for a very long time frames. I acknowledge uh, funding also from uh, Microsoft, uh, especially interested in uh, uh, DNA data storage, the uh, uh, European Union, several projects we've done here, and the whole research group uh, who helps me doing this work. I would like to thank you for your attention, and I'm really looking forward to the discussion on this. Thank you so much, Robert. That was fascinating. I love the uh, bunny connection to Eduardo Katz, uh, GSP bunny <laughs> as well. Um, we have time for a question or two from you before we move on to our next speaker. Uh, so the first question is, to what degree is redundant coding and error correcting coding needed to ensure long-term integrity of the information in a repository? Um, this is a very important question and I kind of intentionally lost, let all of this out in this talk. Um, what we do in our research is a lot about coding and error correction coding. Um, so the first papers who, in 2012 who stored about a megabyte of information in DNA weren't able to perfectly recover the information because they didn't have error correction coding or redundancy. Uh, but now the literature is, I mean, we, uh, in 2015, in this, let's say, Archimedes paper, um, and where we stored the first files in, in DNA for long time frames. These contain error considerable amounts of error correction coding um, and physical redundancy to really enable this, uh, this long-term stability. So it's a really important part of the research. Um, however, a lot of the codes and methods we used are relatively old. They come from other storage formats such as CD-ROM uh, or other coding schemes and they then have to be adapted specifically to the problem of DNA and that's a big part of, of the work we're doing. Wonderful. Um, I know we have many other questions for you, Robert. We're going to save them for the end. Okay, super, questions. yes. Uh, thank you so much uh, for your talk. Next up, we have Christine Schwacher. So I will ask you to turn your video on um, and uh, here is your bio. Christine Schwacher is the Chief Innovation Officer of the Swiss Data Science Center, SDSC, an initiative to accelerate the use of data science and machine learning techniques within academic disciplines and the industrial sector in Switzerland and internationally. She was trained as a statistician and before joining SDSC was a senior research scientist at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Her research interests are health data science and high performance computing, reproducible research in environmental policy and health policy. Recently published works include the New England Journal of Public Medicine, the Journal of the American Medical Association, and Science. And I will let you take it away, Christine. Thank you so much, uh, Julia. Thanks, uh, thanks everyone. So I'll be sharing my. Uh my slides and i have to say after the fantastic talk that robert gave uh, i cannot compete with uh, the massive attack cool stuff and the bunnies so uh, my talk is about uh, so what i call big problems big data so mostly policy uh, health policy environmental policy 
So two domains where uh, we have uh, potentially a lot of data and we uh, want to answer uh, complex uh, questions related to society. So I will uh, use uh, two examples, one from uh, air pollution epidemiology and uh, one from uh, the current COVID-19 pandemic. And I will use these two, um, these two examples to show how uh, research data platforms uh, that we are building at, at the Swiss Data Science Center can help um, dealing with the, uh, the, the future of data, broadly speaking. So my, my first example is, is air pollution epidemiology. So I have pictures, but they're not very pretty. So here in the smog, you can see on the left-hand side, maybe you can see Madrid. On the right-hand side, maybe you can see uh, Milan or Paris. And so, um, so smog, so air pollution is, is a problem. It's a problem in Europe. It's a problem in, in the US, problem in, the, in, in many countries in, in Asia, Latin America, Africa. and um, and so this yellowish thing, smog that you see here, is actually a combination of, uh, of uh, particulate matter uh, and, and other uh, pollutants. And so I'm not a chemist here, I'm a, I'm a statistician, I'm a, I'm a data scientist, but uh, to give you uh, like the, the big picture is, uh, so particulate matter is about the size of, of uh, the pollutants, it's not about what they are. And uh, you may have heard about the like, standard particulate matter, which is a PM10, uh, less than 10 microns. But you may also have heard about fine particulate matter, which is PM2.5, it's like very, very fine particulate matter, which uh, gets very deep into your lungs, right? And, and so it's generated from, uh, so from cars, uh, from uh, power plants, from uh, farming, then complex uh, chemical reactions happen and then it turns emissions uh, many emissions from from uh, from fossil fuel combustion into this fine particulate matter that you end up actually breathing and so um the the, the, the example here is about so air pollution and mortality in a specific population so the medicare population is say uh, it's a bit more in a second, but just to give you like the uh, the message for your lungs, we know it's bad for us. now. Think it's it's very bad, and, and it's in general we know it's bad uh, in terms of an association with mortality. So more pollution, more mortality. And as such, um, particulate matter is regulated. So I will give a, a US example here. So the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, they have, um, they, they, they uh, after uh, the, the Clean Air Act, which was a very important law uh, to protect public health, they issue standards about uh, air quality. And uh, so several uh, pollutants are, uh, are controlled and measured and regulated. So ozone or uh, lead, for example, and particulate matter. So it goes from good to like really, really dangerous. And so here, again, like a high level picture, like I'm showing you uh, what happened in Europe between 98 and uh, 2015. So it goes from zero, which is great, to very dark in this, in this European map, you see that, yes, Spain is sort of, Nice-ish, and then Eastern Europe, Germany, Poland, and Milan are not in good shape. And so here I'm, I'm showing you how it evolves over time. So from not great to not great. So it doesn't really change, actually. So it's slightly better, but still pretty bad. And if I show you the same movie for the US, same years, same color scheme, same everything, you're going to see that it goes from uh, in the Midwest and California and Texas to better and better and better and better. So regulations were, uh, were made, changes, policy changes happened, and so the air quality overall improved. And as I said before, so there's an association between, um, between mortality and air pollution. And our question was, our research question was, um, with how about low levels of air pollution, like the way it happens in the US? So if air pollution is not that bad, is it still associated with mortality? So we created, we gathered a lot of data, I mean, really, really a lot of data. 
we uh, used the entire Medicare population, so people uh, over the age of 65, which uh, were like 60 million people. It was a cohort of half a billion um, people, and we followed them, um, uh, like we followed the 60 million people from 2000 to 2012. We worked like with uh, big data, machine learning, so you uh, may here see these little green dots, and they're actually the dots that correspond to air pollution monitors, so where things are measured on the ground. We used satellite images, deep learning models to reconstruct what, what, what people were exposed to when they were far too monitors. Like, for example, here in Texas, we needed to reconstruct the information. So we did. We were very happy, and we published a paper. So, like, uh, pretty big paper in the, in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, four years ago. And then uh, we started receiving messages. So uh, hell broke loose. That's a nice one. And it reads, so that was sent to me, but many, many were sent. So you clowns are dead in the water and deserve your fate, et cetera, et cetera. So it went from threatening to really creepy. And, um, and so my, my first example here is that this, th there was a lot of, of, of pushback when this paper was published because air pollution in the US is, yeah, it's still there, but it's not that bad in comparison to the rest of the world. And adding more regulations is expensive. And there are political and economic interests who are uh, trying to uh, discredit a lot of research that is done. And there's uh, something called like, um, uh, secret science, right? So what's happening in this situation after this, in this air pollution context is that we use Medicare data, which is claims data from, from the Medicare program, which we cannot share. And there's an agenda that, uh, that started, uh, well, a couple, maybe a decade or two ago, like a couple of administrations ago, uh, that would prevent the EPA from uh, setting new regulations if uh, the raw data and everything associated with uh, the science is not made available uh, in an easy way. And that's sort of a catch-22. And if you remember what happened in the US uh, on uh, January 6th, actually, so January 6th was a busy day in the US, also because the rule was actually passed at the EPA, this called strengthening transparency. So you strengthen transparency with the ambiguous hope that uh, you will regulate the uh, science that can be used to inform public policy. So that, that's my first example, just to give you a context here. And my, my second one, is actually uh, related to, um, so I, I thought quite a bit uh, being, as you can hear from my accent, being French, I thought quite a bit with my, about my American experience in, in air pollution, relocated to Switzerland two years ago to join uh, the Swiss Data Science Center. So it's a center in Zurich and in, in Lausanne. We are about 60 people working full time and we try to accelerate uh, data science or data driven science in academia and in industry. And we, uh, we develop platforms, so we develop software uh, platforms, research platforms, um, to try to uh, help instill trust in, in findings. And so um, the, 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 the main platforms that we develop, uh, so one is called Ranku, and it's to facilitate collaboration in data-driven science, to promote a reusability, sharing of, of, of knowledge. And the, the second is called the Swiss Data Custodian, so to add somehow a, a privacy layer to, to sharing insights. And so we, we are really focusing, um, so when people have a research question, they gather data, they collect, they measure, or they reuse the data from others, then they perform an analysis, and then they share their results. And so we're focusing on uh, the part between like the data and the, and the output to the public through Renku and through uh, in a secure way through the custodian. And, and so what happened when the, uh, when the pandemic started um, like last year, um, we, uh, so we, we started seeing that there was, um, there was a need, uh, uh, at least, at least in, uh, with us, with collaborators, to try to get a sense of what was going to happen. And so we, uh, so Antoine Flau from the, uh, the, the University of Geneva was, uh, was trying to uh, create short-term forecasts, like really what's gonna happen in one week. Are we flat? Are we growing? Are we in real trouble? And so uh, last uh, March, April, we teamed up with him 
and we used our rank crew uh, platform to automatically retrieve data from uh, so from Hopkins, like where uh, that this big COVID dashboard from uh, like uh, initiatives in Switzerland, in Canada, in the UK, etc., to be able to provide a one week forecast for pretty much the entire world and for sub territories, like for cantons in Switzerland, for, uh, for provinces in Canada, etc., where we would have. Um, say, a very short-term uh, assessment of how things were going to go. And we tried to display the information in a way that is useful to the public and uh, also with, with visuals that are easy to read. So that was that Switzerland, uh, like actually today. So that, that's how it sits. And so this, this, this second story, that this second polemic story is, is about the fact that um, we, uh, we think that building the correct uh, data science infrastructures can be helpful to put together domain experts. So in, in that case, our University of Geneva collaborators who are interested in global health uh, and bring them with data scientists, with computer scientists, so that we can automatically download, curate, et cetera, uh, and data, and then display results to the public. And uh, the, this little dashboard we did in, um, in March, April of last year, and uh, we noticed that there was also a need from at the institutional level, for example, uh, so BEA in Switzerland, so the, the, uh, the Federal Office of Public Health is, is using uh, our platform uh, to uh, share uh, in a secure way, right, data related to uh, COVID in different university hospitals across different cantons. And in the same spirit, uh, the WHO uh, is using our tools to get uh, a, a, a panorama of the landscape of what's happening in, in, most Afri of, of, in most countries in Africa. And so from that, actually, I, I have um, two, uh, two things uh, to, uh, that, uh, that I wanted to, uh, to maybe talk about with you all, or two things I wanted to bring with these examples. The, the first one from the epidemiology example is that we talk a lot about data, data sharing, but we don't care so much about data than about insights. So raw data, data about individuals, this is not really something very relevant. What we care is to be able to share insights, so conclusions that we are drawing from this data, and we want to make sure that there is trust that is instilled in this, in the, in this insights. And the second conclusion, like, which is my, my, my pandemic uh, example, the, the COVID dashboard, is that uh, there's a clear need to, uh, for more preparedness. So it, in a sense, a pandemic with a respiratory virus that all experts, so at CDC or uh, European CDC said that it was coming, we knew it was coming and nobody got the, uh, the infrastructure, like no country got the infrastructure ready to be able to leverage uh, data and uh, data insights immediately. And what happened at the beginning of the, of the pandemic, and it's still happening now, is that many people are, um, so in academia or in general in society, are putting their own time, their own resources, their own uh, work there to create somehow ad hoc solutions to, to uh, because there, there was really a, a, a need to, to work together. And it would be uh, nice as societies to think how we can get infrastructures ready in terms of big data preparedness. And, and so the, the, the almost quote to, to really, really conclude is that in many cases where we have data, we don't care about anybody in the sense of caring about specific individuals. We care about everybody. So we try to uh, give answers that would benefit uh, society and, and use uh, data science for the common good. And so uh, I'd like to thank uh, um, so the Fondation des Hôpitaux de Genève for the, uh, the, the funding, the helping us fund the dashboard, uh, the rank crew team at SDSC, Fran Francesca Dominici and Gary King at Harvard, and Antoine Flau uh, at Geneva, and Guillaume Urbanzinski and his team of data scientists at SDSC. And I'm happy to take questions. So much, Christine. I love your point at the end. It's like, okay, we're really good at gathering data. What do we do with it? See, that's the, that's the trick here. Um, so we have time. Uh, we'll do one question now and save the rest for later. Um, first question is, 
how can we improve the accuracy of these statistical tools that you are working with? Uh, in the case of the pandemic, for example, it's extremely complicated. It's a great question, but somehow we don't have a ground truth. So I'm taking, for example, like pandemic, you would see people would report cases, they would report deaths, but we're not sure about the actual numbers because there's a delay in, you know, when states report to, to national authorities, et cetera, et cetera. And so the question, the, the point is we can improve like with usual statistical uh, techniques and get something, you know, we can improve by a couple of percentage, et cetera. But big picture wise, we are in a situation where we don't have a ground truth and that's a huge problem. And that's the same for air pollution. When I use deep learning to reconstruct what people are breathing when they're far from air pollution, monitors, I can add uncertainty to my models, and that's pretty much the best I can do. So what is done, for example, the CDC in the US, what they're doing is that they're doing an ensemble. So they don't take one model, they take dozens of them, and they see they, so they somehow try to communicate a trend and the associated uncertainty. So that's a way, that's a possible way. Thank you so much. Um, and yes, we will get some more questions at the end of all three talks. Uh, so thank you for that fascinating talk. Thank you so much. Next up, we have Rafik Abadal. So you, um, Rafik, I'll ask you to turn your camera on and join us here um, in his very dramatic lighting. <laughs> um, <laughs> the lighting will change. <laughs> AI <laughs> dreaming next to me. Sorry for it. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's perfect. It's very laser. <laughs> Uh, Rafik Anadal is a media artist, director, and pioneer in the aesthetics of data and machine intelligence. His body of work locates creativity at the intersection of humans and machines in taking the data that flows around us as the primary material in the neural network of a computerized mind as its collaborator. Anadal paints with a thinking brush, offering us radical visualizations of our digitized memories and expanding the possibilities of architecture, narrative, and the body in motion. Anadol site-specific AI data sculptures, live audio-visual performances, and immersive installations take many forms while encouraging us to rethink our engagement with the physical world, its temporal and spatial dimensions, and the creative potential of machines. Take it away, Rafik. Thank you very much. Again, so great to be here. I want to share my screen to start um, quickly. And um, if you can see my screen. Yes. OK. So again, thank you very much. Great to be here. I'll do my best to be perfect in 15 minutes in a very little bit rushing way. I'm a media arts and director and currently teaching at UCLA. And I'm, um, and I'm here as an academic, as a practicing, as a media artist, also representing my studio. Um, it is my website, and you are very welcome to follow the journey in any social media. As a media artist or as a, just a child, my journey started by watching this incredible movie that transformed my imagination while I was eight years old without knowing English, but believing that the near future has an incredible potential and more inspired than, uh, more inspired in future than the, I think the past. But over the years, and of course, practice developed, and I'm, I'm, I, I'm, I'm a huge fan of science fiction and understand how humanity grows and what happens in our journey. But also, I got very inspired by technology as a whole. Um, and the technology doesn't mean like I'm just here saying, saying that the techno fetishically understanding what technology is or what does it mean for a value. But I was really much inspired how actually it's transforming who we are as a humanity and our DNA, our gene, and our memories, and our past, and now and future. It's pretty clear that this, this, this tremendous information in the age of like machines is completely changing who we are. And especially the world when the technology like literally becomes this uh, powerful um, life and technology together moment, we also like somehow finding like what is exactly will be in the moment of like transforming the control moments, right? We are in a world that the machines define what to eat, what to say, where to go. I mean, what to buy, what to like, like and share and comment. I mean, this is a world where the control is completely changing. And at the meantime, we are completely in a, this transaction moment of like, what is digital, what is physical, the transition between like the sense of displacement is a very critical moment in life. And I think John Meda, as a genius and a, as a hero, says, design the solution to your problem. Art is a question to your problem. And I totally agree with that. And I wanted to ask, as an artist, the maybe much challenging question is truly, what does it really mean to be a human in 21st century? 
And to answer these questions, I didn't want to do it myself as a, like an egocentric journey. I invited my colleagues, and, and uh, by the way, we are 14 people at the moment and can speak 14 languages and from representing 10 countries. And the idea here is very simply to create art for anyone, any age, and any background, and try to go beyond a 21st century idea of a museum or gallery. And to make this happen, we focus heavily on public art, a place where the idea can survive without any bias architecture, going beyond, going beyond just glass stainless steel or concrete and try to generate experiences all over the world and try to find that language like mathematics a language of arts that connect the boundaries of between cultures and memories and collective the memories and dreams of humanity and last last even like and during the pandemic when the world is in this crisis mentally physically financially and and psychologically, we didn't stop thinking and producing. And we were constantly thinking, how can we use machine intelligence? Specifically, my journey started 2016 with a residency at Google AI called Artists and Mission Intelligence Group. And thanks to Kenrick McDowell and Mike Taika, I was one of the first artists in residence who can be able to generate um, experiences and learn how to use AI technologies from one of the most wonderful minds. But for this project, I didn't want to just stop in, the, in just using AI in a techno fetish context. I really would like to talk about how can we use media arts and how can we, I'm sorry, there's like a, a slack going on. I need to close this and I'm sorry for that. And the question here is how can we use mission intelligence truly to analyze how can we transform information into a knowledge event, eventually turn into a wisdom? And to make it happen, Archive Dreaming was our first project, 2016. And the, clear, the idea was, what will happen if a library in the future can hold the information by creating connection between the institutions, with the ideas, with the not past and the now and the future, and let a human to just witness what happens if a machine can learn? And this was a performative piece of experience, but also it's an immersive piece where the audience could interact with 1.7 million documents. Or later on, we worked with wonderful mind Ian Hodder, professor from Stanford, where he was excavating Chatal Hoyuk archaeologically for 25 years. And we let the AI also look at his body of work and try to generate meaning between 25 years of excavation of and thousands of years of information. And what I'm trying to say is, instead of like stuck in the ramification of a technology, here as a studio, we are asking, what else can we do? What else can we produce beyond just ramifications? And as a studio, we just produce by purposefully and creating impactful narratives by using mission intelligence and colliding with architecture and most likely the archives of purposeful institutions. And here, I don't want to be, a, by, by the way, a pure art studio and always try to understand how can we tra transform data into a pigmentation? Or as an artist, how can I use with a thinking brush and paint with machine consciousness? So right now we are watching one of the most projects that I think I'm very inspired, also very uh, heavily work on, which I will explain at the end of the presentation. And thanks to the support from the uh, friends at NMedia, we have been also working the last four years with GAN algorithms, generative algorithm networks. And for that project, the whole idea is how can we use collective memories of humanity, such as the, the space journeys, like the Hubble, like the uh, ISS or MRO, the machines looking for the future of humanity, and how can we generate some collective dream from this information? And as, an, as a, by the way, a photographer in my journey started, like, I'm really inspired by the idea of a memory. And I think for me, data is not just numbers. Data is not just you know, um, a bunch of knowledge, but it's literally a kind of a memory, I think, and a, it's a form of a memory. And if you think about that, then I really enjoyed what happens if we use mission intelligence to create this collective consciousness and represent them in also data universes. So very obsessed with lower dimension reduction, which is a kind of a technique that allows researchers or thinkers or designers to see what exactly that raw archives of information can be connected and how these relationships can be a new ways of looking and invisible and making invisible more visible. And I think mission intelligence has a very powerful context of creating that invisible and visible relationships. And it's one of the reasons as a studio, we have been heavily working on lower dimension reduction algorithms to look off this vast amount of information in the age of mission intelligence and try to generate meaningful and purposeful poetic experiences. And to make this happen, we sometimes use cultural archives, specifically like Renaissance or like in, in Stockholm, City of Stockholm, looking at the archives, or sometimes looking at like 
um, the body of work of heroes of an architecture like Frank Gehry, Zaha Hadid, Tato Ando, um, and, and Toya Ito, or in Leighton Bing project in Berlin, we look at the city of Berlin as a whole, a city with an incredibly powerful history and an important learning curve as, as a culture, we have a look at also the same patterns. Um, and while we are doing our own cultural uh, expectations and ex expeditions, we also generate our custom softwares while looking at how to visualize latent space. For example, in my recent TED talk, also analyze every single TED talk that is publicly available and reconstruct the ways of understanding that is again, unseen and invisible and look at the questions that last 30 years ever asked on TED stage. But I think that generally what was really inspiring in our journey, I think that when we do artwork and those artworks sometimes have a performance quality and these performances are mostly open to public, meaning anyone, any age and any background can have an experience by stepping inside the feeling of a mind of a machine. So what does this mean? So for example, when I see a space as an artist, I guess from a childhood dream, I really think that spaces, the architecture should be beyond what we perceive. I do believe that if there is no gravity problem, <laughs> one of the most fundamental physics problem of architecture, I think light is an incredible material, how Robert explained the DNA context. I think light is one of the most inspiring material in the world that is kind of an unbiased form of like energy that can travel in time and space from the quantum physics, maybe there's a different context of itself and can be particle and wavelengths. But for me, light is an incredible pigmentation of mission intelligence. And if we really collide light, data, and mission intelligence, if we collide neuroscience, AI, and architecture, I do think that near future, the buildings will remember, the buildings will learn, and eventually dream. To speculate this project last year at Artec House, we were able to generate a project called Machine Hallucination. And for this project, we were able to collect 113 million images of New York and specifically spend time, a very serious time, and find every private moments in this data set, specifically detach ego from data to generate an artificial narrative in the context of an immersive environment. By using 18 channel projection and 32 channel sound, we generate an experience, a narrative of 30 minutes, a feeling of flying in the mind of a machine while before or after dreaming a certain scenario. We use multiple neural networks, deep neural networks, and again use NVIDIA StyleGen algorithm and generate almost realistic New York. And this boiler room for 120 years it never visited before. And then when the audience comes in, we had this very magical moment. It was only 30 minutes and we had visit visitors all over the world and more than 100,000 people. But the reaction was beautifully poetic when the, I think the idea has this depth, discourse and context. By the way, in all our projects, we do our very best to share which algorithms we share why we use, what kind of data we, we, pro, we, we collect, and how do we clean this. And this openness is sometimes not required in the arts, as we all know. Centuries old paintings, sculptures have never had that discourse or context in terms of the technology and the knowledge behind them, unless you have a research. But we specifically take this very serious and try to explain this powerful medium, this powerful technology, and also share and ask questions and let the audience ask questions and become very open-minded about the near future. And lastly, I think a project that truly changed our trajectory was called WCH Dreams. It happened two years ago here in Los Angeles, California. It was a dream project to let this beautiful building of Frank Gehry, one of my hero, and let LA Philharmonics this house for 15 years, one of the most prominent buildings in Los Angeles, a cultural beacon, and let this building like a science fiction movie, like Blade Runner downtown Los Angeles, let it dream and hallucinate. To make this happen, we were able to generate these pieces by using 42 channel projection for five nights, open to anyone, any age, any background, a truly free public art, and uses 100 years of Philharmonic orchestras, every single data point exists. By using machine intelligence and reconstructing Frank Gehry's building, seeing, seeing through the facade of the building, kind of creating a, a living skin, a kind of a skin on top of a building, 
kind of a feeling that the building remembers its own trajectory, the reason why it's there, and even ask the question, what will happen if one day, if architecture has a consciousness? What will happen if one day a space remembers its own context? Like, what will it ask? What will be the first question? Like, will they ask, like, do I need to look like this? Like, can I ever, like, change my material? Can I look like this? I mean, they're, of course, very aesthetic questions, but they are literally functional narratives that are not just fancy, shiny pixels. They are truly using existing algorithms 21st century to really light up a ways of new questions for the field of architecture, which I do believe that whenever we have this colliding multiple disciplines together purposefully, there's an incredible potential of finding new meaning in life, in our journey as humanity. And I think machine intelligence, specifically AI, and in this context, big data, is an incredible potential. And simply to just sum up, as a studio, and I think as a media artist, I, I, I found that art for me is humanity's capacity of imagination. And as a team, we are trying to use our most able <laughs> capacity of imagination to push the boundaries of our imagination and also to push the boundaries of technology. And when they collide, we found that there is serendipity. We found that there is a meaning that can be understood even though you have a limited knowledge about existing technologies and they capture the imagination of the audience who may also be an involved in this journey of humanity. Like the fire we found, we always learn that with the same technologies, we generate culture and connect. With the same technology, we disconnect and destroy each other. And I think AI has a very similar 50-50%, like very quantum mechanics. We have to be extremely careful about that. And for this purpose, I do believe that public art, and in this context, AI data sculptures, or augmenting architectural spaces that are designed for something else or functioning for something else. And I think if we use them as a canvas and if we create those narratives as a meaning, I think we can create something very, very purposeful. So today, that's a very humble journey in 15 minutes. And I do hope you like it and happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much and happy to share more with you. Thank you so much, Rafik. That was indeed a whirlwind tour of some of your amazing work. Um, we will take uh, a question for you as our other panelists rejoin us on video. Um, so this question is from Jennifer. Do you believe that we are moving towards singularity? She says, I would be curious to hear your thoughts about this, especially in the context of thinking about machines as capable of consciousness and dream. Um, so, I, I mean, of course, it's a predictable that uh, machines and humans will connect and collide. I mean, I don't think it is, it is hard to guess anymore. But I think my personal take about this question is, instead of <laughs> making humans more machine, I think making machines more human may give us more information. And the latter has a less ramifications because I don't think we understand who we are. Like, we have no answer to the consciousness in a quantified way yet. We don't know truly what is quantum mechanics, quantum gravity. We have so much missing gaps in the humanity that even we don't know how to understand nature in that context. So I do not believe that machines will able to collide these universes because we are not aware of what we are being. The challenge may be a machine with less awareness and like a mimicking consciousness can be an issue, which is true. But then I will ask the question for myself from my practice, if a machine one day decide to decide and generate its own consciousness and its own culture, and suddenly makes its own art, I will absolutely say, please join us in our studio. We are very welcome and we are happy <laughs> to collaborate with you. I'm very optimist and I think that being optimist is what we need because otherwise we may not able to generate purposeful and, and most likely functional questions that we may need to go beyond what we have these ramifications. Wonderful, thank you. And thank you again for your talk. Um, Thank you to all of our speakers for your talk. So Robert and Christine, if you would like to rejoin us on video, we have many, many questions from the audience to get to here. And I will let uh, Laura handle the Q&A portion. Thank you so much. And thanks for all of you. I don't know how our audience feels, but I am stoked and I am truly impressed by all of your talks. So thank you very much, Robert, Christine, and also Refik. Um, I found it very inspiring. Um, we have a lot of questions from the audience and I will start with one question for Robert and it is from Benedict Alois Borgo. He asks, what methods are available and how difficult is it to do a data recovery and the DNA approach 
if it does get damaged? Um, um, that, that, that's actually something we are working on quite heavily. Um, is uh, what, yeah, exactly what happens when the DNA gets damaged. So one tool we have is uh, error correction coding, um, where we re introduce redundancy into the data before we synthesize it. So there's, let's say, some protective data in there that in case the DNA sequences, for example, gets damaged, um, we can take that redundant information to correct for that. That's something that's been done with all other storage media previously. Um, but for that, we have to know what kind of damage we have to expect for that to work. If we don't know what kind of damage to expect, we have to look at other technologies. And at the moment, we are looking a lot into um, enzymatic repair. That's something we have in our human body that constantly repairs our DNA from damage uh, it, 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 it receives. Uh, we, uh, most people are aware of um, DNA repair because if it doesn't work, it usually leads to cancer because then there's a, a real error. In, and we are now trying to use these enzymes outside of the human body, so in an artificial setting, to repair synthetic DNA sequences and repair these errors that have been introduced during storage. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question is for Christine. And Evis Burich or Burich is asking, what exactly is a secure way of, share, of sharing data? Uh, <laughs> so that's a great question. I'm not sure I have uh, uh, the, the, the great answer, actually. So there are several approaches that you can do. So you can think of restricting access. So you share data, uh, but only to people who have, who have you know, a specific training, you know who they are, and then you keep an, an e-trail of what they are doing. But you can also you can also try to uh, remove so, a certain type of information. So instead of giving the age of somebody, you give an age interval. So you somehow dilute the information. And uh, more recent more recent things, and I'm not talking about the encrypting type of aspects, but like more recent approaches might be. Um, you actually don't share the data itself. You let people try to find insights on, on the data. And that could be the world of differential privacy, uh, where you actually uh, give answers based on the data that is slightly modified by a random error. So you, you care, say, if you care about, say, the average population height in the US, whether it's like like um, like whether the fourth digit is exactly the right answer, you don't really care. So you're going to return an answer which is slightly affected by a random perturbation. So these are these type of approaches, but it's a huge huge field. Or you can also think better like this federated or edge type of, of things where the data is not going to let's say your smartphone, for example, but like it's going to be computed and then you'll get information from your device that is going to be aggregated later. But it's, uh, it's uh, I team up with privacy people and I'm not sure we would have the exact answer. But like in, in the specific uh, of, of like policy making, the first step would be share whatever you can share, for example, your, your software codes or the, uh, the software that you're using so that people can audit even if they don't access the data directly. There's a lot you can learn already. That's, uh, yeah, try to make it short. Yes, that's, that's what I have so far. Thank you. So the next question I'm sure is um, interesting for everyone, but I'm going to ask it uh, to Refik because I know this is kind of what you have been doing lately. The question is just simply, what about blockchain? That's an incredibly important question. At the moment, I'm very sorry, but I'm literally also in the same mindset of currently trying crypto art change exchange. And first of all, I'm extremely inspired by the idea of distribution of information through new technologies. Of course, like Robert's incredible idea of using DNA and other more functional ways is I think somehow if the two worlds collide, there's some interesting world may happen. But at the moment, um, I think it's inspiring. I just read recently, and unfortunately, I recently, how it's impactful for nature. And I just read literally yesterday. So I wasn't aware of how actually powerful it is in terms of the nature context. But so there's an interesting feeling. It's something as an idea, as a concept, is incredibly inspiring. And it's probably much inspiring than what we have as an old world. But at the meantime, it may have a potential problem for the nature. So I am literally in that very openly biased mode, I mean, unbiased mode of the technology but I know that it's dangerous for nature. 
So very often I don't want to hide, hide this feeling. But in the meantime, it's incredibly powerful that the world can do something different than an old school ways of changing information. So I cannot hide my excitement about the freshness, clarity, and the genius ideas may arise from the idea. So, so my honest take is if this becomes less problem for nature, hopefully, the idea itself is one of the most inspiring thing, many things may be shared. And I'm personally trying to find ways of how to collide physical and virtual worlds. And right now I'm trying an experiment at the moment in a crypto art world, like how can I validate an information that an audience can have a feeling of ownership in this, you know, narrow, this network, but also have a physical entity connection. These are like things I'm really understanding. How can we make invisible more visible shortly? So it is an incredible potential for humanity if it is less concerned for the nature. I agree very much with you. Um, we're going back to um, a DNA based question for Robert. Um, Ivan Amato is asking, are you confident that DNA reading technology will have as much long longevity as the info packed DNA itself? Um, this is also an important question that often uh, always arises if you think about the future information storage tools. And their DNA has a really unique advantage um, that we use the same technology for reading information as we use for re reading our genome. So as long as we are able to read our genome, <coughs> or, uh, if you think of a future society, if it has the technological level of reading genomes, it will be interested in being able to read genomes. It will also have the technical means to read information stored in DNA. One problem that's not solved by that, and that's common to all digital technologies, is interpretation of the data. So with every digital data format, if you have a hard disk or D information in DNA or any other digital format, I just get zeros and ones. And we as humans don't understand zeros and ones. So we have to know the code or the instructions of how we get from those zeros and ones back to something we can interpret, back to an image on text or music or something we can, we can understand. And in all digital storage technologies, the instructions on how that can be done have to be stored in an interpretable way together with the information where we need kind of a really like a Rosetta Stone, where Rosetta Stone is where you had this uh, um, Egyptian and ancient Greek on the same, let's say, same text on the stone, and that make the ancient, um, the, the, the Egyptian interpretable. For any digital data that you want to store for the future, you need instructions stored just as stably as the information in an interpretable way. Um, usually these instructions need a lot less space or a lot less information dense than the information that you actually store. So I can store terabytes of information in DNA um, and I can put that together, for example, with a stone in which I've inscribed the instructions that a zero zero, that A is a zero zero and the T is a zero one, and then how I can have a JPEG um, code that gets that back into an image. I, I have to give that information, otherwise it's complete, any digital information is completely useless without ways of interpreting that information. Thank you. Um, our next question is again for Refik from Anur Essa. He asks, a lot of your work feels very immersive. How will advancements of AR and VR play a role in your work and achieving even more immersion? It's a very beautiful question. At the moment, what I was extremely inspired was this concept of XR, like extending reality instead of AR and VR, maybe combination of that universe. I'm still a little bit like, I'm having a hard time to feel that when you wear a device, your, your consciousness is augmented by a machine, heavy, heavy things, and you have a glass. And yeah, that, that feeling, I'm still having a hard time to forget it, that I'm wearing something. But it's very inspiring. But what I found more inspiring is we were recently experimenting because of our Renaissance project to speculate the future of painting concept. We were able to generate a live augmentation of someone's perspective. Like last, uh, last March, we did the first experiment. And then still using VR technology, tracking a person. And then the audience were able to generate new perspective wherever he or she is. The machine can define the perspective. 
And then that person can also become a pigmentation, a brush that can create a kind of a narrative also in the painting that they're painting. This was really interesting and very, you know, um, fun speculation after like, a, you know, 13, 1600s uh, Renaissance paintings and taking them as an AI context and regenerate a new pigmentation and let this time 21st century audience becomes a perspective. Like generating a trompe basically. I mean, if you look at the whole past stories, like how can we bring that ideas back again, but this time using current technology, it was really fun. And I found very um, beautiful reaction from especially the young generations. And even I'm an elder people, I enjoy to be honest, like interacting with a machine, redrawing <laughs> like a pigmentation of Renaissance paintings. It was fun. It was really engaging and very social. Awesome. So now that you were talking about uh, the younger generations, I actually um, have a question to all of you. Um, and this is now coming from your own expertise and under the premise also of thinking multiple steps ahead in our future. Um, what do we have to embed in the education of our younger generations or differently, what do we have to make them know and make them understand in order to create a, a good future for them? A super difficult question. Uh, I, 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 think I think education is really important, digital education. Um, something that we miss in our modern education is how do these digital tools really work in, let's say, I mean, I'm thinking more of a, let's say, a high school university education uh, that there's a lot of things we don't know on how these technologies work that we should know because only then we can extend them and build on them and we should not only be a user of those technologies um, and say there are a few experts somewhere who know how they, how they work. Um, I mean, that's with machine learning. We, we, our education should enable to be, keep constant with all of that. It's extremely difficult because the teachers are usually from an older generation. They have to learn that themselves first. So for example, teaching the ideas of uh, artificial intelligence can be taught to anyone, the ideas. And only if he understands the ideas, he can judge by himself what can it do? How can that be useful for me? Or how can that influence me and can make better judgments for, for themselves? I think education in digital tools, how they work, how a digital world really works is something really, really important. Uh, starting from how the computer works, how communication works, um, all of those things are extremely important to us that we're not only users of the technology, but kind of own the technology in, to a certain extent. Thank you. So if I, if I may carry on, Robert, on what, on what you are uh, saying, so I, I completely agree. And I would maybe add that uh, bringing uh, like literacy in computing, in understanding um, uh, risk, for example, risk assessment would be fantastic, like having a critical way, uh, like a critical data um, driven type of education from high school uh, who are users of technology and many people would uh, know how definitely know how to use a computer they could not even program the way kids would in the in the early ages and and the other aspect Sorry, Christine, I think thank you those tools that we have not the economic forces side. that are at stake where you would see that yeah my internet was off yeah. Yeah. a little yeah no no not my cross a bit um a little bit unstable didn't get the last part of what you said so so, so pretty much saying that uh, also understand the, the economic powers at stake. Some people would, uh, we share our lives on our phones, like our locations or everything. And um, I don't know whether we realize all the all, all the, the things that we are sharing to get free tools. And so education also in this aspect of, of you know, a, a balance of, of knowledge between technology providers and technology users. Right. Thank you. So the next question I will be reading is uh, for Resik again, and it is from Julia. Uh, she asked, the original Blade Runner film stuck with you as a child and helped to inspire the type of art research you do today. 
what recent sci-fi films or books do you think show us a potential future of data, art, or AI? So I, I think very openly when I watch it, I didn't know English. And I think I was truly inspired by the future of Los Angeles in the very first. And I think understanding like the flying cars, beautiful Asian face, or like a media architecture and dystopian. But I think at that age, I don't feel what is dystopian, what is utopian. I think I feel like the future is shiny, bright, and it's different. It's just because when I look at Istanbul in my hometown from outside, it's like the world of what the um, Ridley Scott or Philip K. Dick's imagination, it was completely different. Um, but what was the inspiration for me came later is when my cousin said that, do you know that those are not human? Like they are like sentient beings that are talking to each other. I think there was a click in my mind that, I mean, as a gamer, I was already inspired by the machines as a game, <laughs> like tool of like imagining, but never thought that a machine has a body of human and also communicating with each other in an emotional context. So that was very interesting, to be honest. That was where the AI idea really inspired me a lot, that machine can also have a body of human. And the other thing that really inspired me is, of course, the architectural future of the you know, near future. Um, that was like a two inspiration. And the other thing that was really um, opened my mind is Philip K. Dick as a whole. I mean, his body of work and how he inspired many generations and his simulation worlds are still in my mind, always like um, how he, he contextualized the simulation idea. But recently, I'm a really big fan of Alex Greenland and his incredible ex machina, but most of the like devs speculating quantum mechanics and quantum computation. And it was an incredibly powerful story. And that's one of the reasons actually, I work with quantum AI, uh, Google AI quantum team in actually here in Los Angeles. And we work with their um, quantum supremacy data set. And we were able to generate a piece called Quantum Memories in National Gallery of Victoria in Austra Australia, in Melbourne. So the idea was simply use their um, very challenging supremacy data set and try to look the subatomic world of randomization and generate a quantum noise and inspire AI to generate an alternative realities of nature, but really based on science, not like a potato science. And it was really inspiring. And that was really ex machina or Alec Greenland's vision of quantum um, state life and future of humanity was inspiration. That's my current very much, and of course, William Gibson all the time. I mean, Nora Mansell probably, <laughs> like, a, like a best of the thing, the feeling I got inspired a lot, I guess. Those are like my very go-to first answers. And where can we see your latest installations? Oh, at the moment, it's live in Melbourne because I think there's a very successful uh, COVID situation in Melbourne, good news. And they opened the exhibition in Triennale till I think April. Um, the other piece will be in Istanbul again in March, focusing and in here in Los Angeles and NASA GPL when the world opens up again. And in Renaissance Dreams in Milano at the moment, um, and hopefully will open soon. That's still waiting some inputs from the government. Um, so many exhibitions are on hold, like installed, waiting audiences, but NGV is up and running quantum memories at the moment. And I'm seeing people so far healthy and no issues so far last one month. So the next question um, is for Christine. Um, what is the most challenging aspect of your work when it comes to working with huge amount of data? Yeah, so pretty much who's going to pay for it? Like, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's like we uh, uh, taking the, uh, the, the Medicare example, we have to buy Medicare, so it's a couple of hundreds of thousands. Then we need to buy computers to uh, to process the data, and then we have to make sure that. Uh, so it, it's it's I think the most challenging for us is is building infrastructure. So it can take years and years and years, uh, and hiring teams uh, and to to scaling up is very hard. So if you study say air pollution in Boston, you can run it on a laptop in, in many instances, but when you start to scale up things get complicated and you need to attract, uh, train uh, talent and build build an infrastructure. So that's really the, the complicated part. And the second part is also sometimes your work is not um, seen in the light that you would expect, like the, the, the emails that we got after publications. And so that's also part of uh, getting into a realm of, of political forces that, that we did not really expect, or that some people did, but I did not. I did not. So now, I thank you very much, Christine. Um, I do want to get to another question here, and it's about digital assets. Um, it's 
goes to Robert. Um, the question is, do you think it would be possible to have DNA storage with all your finances, digital assets such as, as uh, crypto fiat or even um, precious metals in one place? Would that make sense instead of, for example, a ledger? Uh, yeah, I, I think it makes sense to use DNA as a storage tool for financial information um, because of its advantages that you can uh, um, keep in a very small space, you can hide it in something that nobody knows that it's there, it's stable for, for a long time. There's also been a company trying to sell something like that. Um, we ourselves are more interested in, in merging personal information with digital information. Uh, where personal information in our DNA, let's say also we have digit, that, that, that digital aspects or personality, personal aspects of, of DNA. Um, I think that's common with all of, uh, uh, Christine has already touched on that, um, data and uh, identity is always closely connected. And in our case, especially if we use DNA and if we then also try to use personal DNA um, to do something. For example, we've uh, recently shown that you can take um, genetic information from a person as a cryptographic key to encrypt digital information in DNA. And so that's kind of mixing those two worlds in a way that might be extremely useful because you can always identify as yourself using your DNA. But perhaps there are also cases where you don't want to do that because you don't want to be as transparent or as as person-oriented um, uh, or identity-oriented. And so that's a, a phase in, in line be between those two things. Um, we, uh, as a scientist, we are tool developers. So we want to show what is possible, what can be done using personal DNA or synthetic DNA, and then kind of um, a market or use has to arise out of that, um, that shows that which of those tools are, are useful for, of course, we have ideas what we think that might be useful, but there has to be a further journey in what can be done with those technical tools. I think that's also very similar to what Refik said about blockchain. I think blockchain is also kind of in that, in that world. It's a, it's a very powerful tool, but I don't think it has find, found its perfect place yet. Where does it sit? in between contracts or in between banks or in between other money, what is its final place where it can, has a differentiating advantage and use in all aspects containing every, every and all aspects of it. And that's, that's a transition that we can very nicely follow with, everyone kind of follows it with blockchain, but we have that with many other technologies as they arise and they have to find their, their space in where they're useful for us in the end. Some might never find that space, but that's also okay. They have to go on that journey in finding their space, compete really, comp in our lab, they don't have to compete with other technologies. They only have to, we, we put them into the best light to show their advantages. But in the end, in real use, they have to compete on a market with users, with all the other technologies they compete, they work against and find their space to, to generate value. Thank you very much. And I just shortly want to um, stay here and um, with the blockchains just for a second and ask Refik another question from the audience. It asks, would Refik be able to expand upon the risks of blockchain to nature? So that's an incredible question. Again, I just read the article yesterday and honestly just digesting at the moment. Um, I, but again, I think as a, as a as a means of express, expressing the, the potentials of these ideas in nature. I feel like, as Robert mentioned, the science is the only way I'm feeling the connection can be done. I'm trying to, I'm, I mean, I think the big, big support for us to think is when we detach ego from data, I think we are finding something inspiring for humanity. That's for sure. So when we do that, I think even the blockchain, which is again, the IPs, the IDs, the token, tokens, they, I mean, the concepts always have some ownership thing, right? And then the nature impact can only be, I think, eliminated when it's coming from nature, I guess. Like 
I can't imagine a machine is doing everything like a very pure cold, I mean, cold meaning just machine machines without consciousness. But if, if really someday, which is nearly, I mean, not a someday anymore, a current research that Robert also mentioned, I think is a true inspiration, like colliding the organic natural world and a machine's potentials and finding that correlation is an answer to this. Um, of course, currently we are experimenting with, you know, smart contracts and, and their smart ways of imagining things that only exist in the physical world that go to the virtual world and they have some ownership feeling and other like, you know, very humanistic, you know, desires. But like, can they be used for perform better computation? Can they be performed, do more smart actions that we cannot perceive by our own entities or by our own machines? These questions, I think, or can do space research, cancer research, or, you know, microcell. I mean, th there's a lot of, I think, questions can be asked, asked there. And if that becomes that functional, helps nature. And that narrative is more powerful than just egocentric experiences, I guess. Beautiful, thank you. So according to our time, I will ask one very last question, which I do ask to all of you. Um, and this question is, if you could collaborate with any organization or individual, regardless of financial capabilities, what would be your project? With whom would you work on it? And that's now probably very tricky. <laughs> Okay, I, I take it. Um, so I would love to to see a non-commercial uh, cloud computing solution that would be accessible, uh, broadly speaking. So away from like funded by governments, NGOs, etc., where we could actually leverage uh, computing at scale without having to worry about. Uh, about like the commercial aspects or where my data sits or who I'm feeding uh, when I'm depositing my data. Um, I'll, uh, one idea at least we uh, is uh, working with the World Wildlife Foundation on uh, preserving uh, genetic data from uh, um, uh, animals. Uh, nearly extinct animals, um, not only with the goal of preserving that DNA, but also uh, generating awareness about that, uh, that problem by showing that they can be preserved, for example, as, as, prod as products which, which could be sold. Um, um, so really this uh, connection between preservation, um, animal wildlife, uh, diversity, that, that's something I would be extremely interested in. Not so data heavy, but really around DNA and, and, and preservation. Um, yeah, that, that would be one. Um, also, of course, UNESCO, there's the Memories of the World, uh, preservation of important documents. That's also something we would be extremely interested in, in, in working in. In the end, the same idea, but not for wildlife, but, but for really data or documents that, that should be preserved for the, for the future. So who knows, maybe someone from UNESCO is here and will hit you up afterwards. <laughs> I, I definitely agree with Robert's last wish about library of the future for humanity. Like how do we hold these things we cannot touch, but we know it's there. Uh, we are losing the pen and pencil, but we need to remember. But I would like to say, I, I would like to work with an institution who is trying to cure demands and Alzheimer that hopefully the ideas, memories, future past doesn't go away. And I wish there's someone in the world who is ready for uh, curing this problem that will allow us to remember longer and doesn't get our memories melted. Beautiful. So with those words, um, I will finish this laser talk. Uh, again, thank you so much for our speakers. Um, it was incredible. I really enjoyed it a lot. And thank you very much for your audience for the very interesting questions, everyone. We still had more questions, but at this point, we just have to cut the time. Um, Julia, give the word to you. Yes, thank you so much to our speakers. Your talks were amazing and inspiring. And as usual, laser could run for another hour or two or a whole conference, right? Um, that's, that's really our goal is to 
is to start conversations and, and start to dive into some of these really interesting subjects. And hopefully these conversations will continue uh, wherever you may be. Thank you to our audience for tuning in as always. Um, I know that some of you may be joined late. Uh, we will have a recording of this laser uploaded to the SwissMax and SciArt YouTube channels sometime next week. So look out for that on our social media. And um, yeah, thanks again to our wonderful speakers and for joining us here today.